Okay, everybody, I show that it is seven o'clock. And as promised, I am going to do um, my live stream of the AKC official standard of the Dachshund. Again, since the last time I did this, my feed was interrupted. So we shouldn't have any problems this time. So um, I'm glad that you're joining me this evening to go over this, talk about the breed that I love. Okay, a real fast disclaimer, this presentation is not is sponsored or endorsed by any formal organization or entity. While we invite judges and other authorities, this should not be deemed as an official education event. Um, this also does not take the place of any kind of hands-on learning or seminars. And if you are an AKC judge and you're watching this video, it does not count as official credit um, towards your CPU stuff for your approvals. Um, this is just to give information to you, help you understand our breed standard better. Uh, we have a lot of new people coming up in dachshunds and sometimes our standard can be overwhelming. So I hope that everybody enjoys. Um, just a little bit about me. I uh, am a school teacher. I have a bachelor's degree in music and a master's degree in education, school administration. Um, I've taught for almost 22 years, getting ready to start my 22 uh, second year in the classroom. I purchased my very first show dachshund, West Winds Pistol, in May 2002. And I put a championship on him. He was a wonderful starter dog, and I really enjoyed having him. Um, I have bred over 40 confirmation champions and a field champion under the Hialeah prefix. And one of my goals in doing so is to have um, top producers um, for, with ROM or ROMX achievements. I had the top producing smooth bitch for 2016, uh, the love of my life, Hialeah's Effie Trinket. I've been a member of DCA since 2004. And I'm currently a member of the Dallas Fort Worth Dachshund Club, I'm serving as president. And I am also the secretary for the Texas Combined Specialty Association. And I am the, as of yesterday, recently retired show chair for 2020. Let's talk about dachshund anatomy. So when you think about dachshunds and out in the public, this is kind of what they're thinking. It looks like a hot dog, a wiener dog, um, but that's not exactly what we are wanting to do um, as far as confirmation dogs. Form and function, you can see um, quite well <laughs> what dachshunds form and function is. You know, they are born diggers. And so a lot of times when you go outside, if they're not going a million miles an hour, they're probably digging down in a hole or popping their head out of one. And if you see the rear end of a dachshund usually trying to go under a fence, you want to grab them up real fast before they disappear. If they can get their head through it, they can usually get their body through it. They're great field dogs. They've got natural hunting ability and they're very versatile. Dachshund means badger dog. And you can see a picture of the badger over there on your screen. Isn't he delightful? He looks like a whole bunch of fun. So that's what they're bred to do is to go and, you know, flush out and battle these horrible looking creatures. Uh, dachshunds are from a hunting dog from Europe and they were further developed, particularly in Germany in the late 1700s, early 1800s. And they were bred to hunt above and below ground. The standard smooth dachshund is thought of as the original of the breed. Uh, the standard dachshund was originally bred to flush badgers and other burrow dwelling pests out from underneath the ground. Um, Arvin Dubrovnia likes to call them badger agitators, which is one of my favorite analogies I think I've ever heard about dachshunds. Um, they're agitating no matter what, but then you put them underground to get a badger and they're definitely going to agitate and flush. Um, miniature dachshunds are smaller in size and they're intended for the dog to hunt smaller prey such as rabbits and rats and other rodent-like animals. Um, and badgers, you know, are these big, mean, destructive animals in the forest. 
And so you can see in that picture how big they are compared to the dachshund, and that's their foe that they have to battle underground. And um, the other thing about miniature dachshunds and dachshunds in general is they're very good surface hunters and they're very good at flush, um, flushing the foliage. So they have to be good above and below ground. The dachshund is part of the hound group in AKC and they are a scent hound. The hound group is divided into sight and scent hounds and the dachshund is definitely a scent hound. They've usually got their nose in a place that doesn't belong. Dachshunds are billed to fold, and we're gonna talk about that later in this presentation. They have to fold down and get in tiny cramped spaces when they're going in a hole, um, you know, going down to battle that badger or whatever <clears throat> vermin they're trying to flush out. They have to fold down like a carpenter ruler or like an accordion. I put those pictures on the slide for you so that you can see. And so it's very important that their structure is correct for them to be able to do that. We're going to talk about that tonight. Dachshunds um, were first recognized as a breed with AKC in 1885. And in 1895, the Dachshund Club of America became a member of the AKC family. Here is a diagram of the dachshund. And a lot of what we're going to talk about tonight is based off of the visual, visualization of the official dachshund standard that's published by the Dachshund Club of America. This is a great diagram for um, especially beginners. If you're not familiar with any kind of anatomy or terms, this is an excellent resource right here to let you know terminology about what breeders and people who are talking about dachshunds will say. Um, a few notes on this particular diagram. Some places in this, it'll say breastbone. Um, that, another word for that is post-sternum. So know that those words are interchangeable. So when someone's talking about that, that's what that means. And another note is they have um, the pastern and the wrist listed together, but they don't consider you know, anything in the back a pastern, you know, we call it a hawk, and we'll talk about that later. Dachshunds are a series of angles, and this is very important when we talk about the dachshund structure, and it's a little bit different than a lot of other breeds. There's not a specific angle in our standard, um, except for the upper arm and shoulder blade is, you want that to be a 90 degree angle. So, everything else is you know pretty much speculation and a lot of it's just math and and balance but the the specific angle listed in the standard is a 90 degree angle between the shoulder blade and the upper arm um i think that this is very interesting if you're not quite familiar with dachshund proportions we don't have specific proportions listed in our standard like some of the other breeds do so a very famous um dachshund person from, you know, the early 1930s named Horswell came up with his formula called the concept of balance. And what he does is he uses the length of head as a unit of measurement. So you take the length of the head and the neck and the tail are all the same length, while the back is twice the length of the head. And his thinking was that the distance from the withers to the lowest point of the keel should equal the length of the head. So the length is one head length, and it could be up to one head length plus give or take a quarter of an inch, a quarter eighth of an inch, and that's just to give some wiggle room for balance. Um, our general appearance of a dachshund, okay? Long, low to the ground, long in body and short of leg with robust muscular movement. The skin is elastic and pliable without excessive wrinkling, appearing neither crippled, awkward, nor cramped in his capacity for movement. The dachshund is well balanced with bold and confident head carriage and intelligent, alert facial expression. His hunting spirit, good nose, loud tongue, and distinctive build make him well suited for below ground work and for beating the bush. His keen nose gives him an advantage over most other breeds for trailing. And this is a note 
directly from our standard. In as much as the dachshund is a hunting dog, scars from honorable wounds shall not be considered a fault. So this is a general appearance of a dachshund. The other thing it doesn't mention here, but needs to be in that general appearance is there needs to be some strong heavy bone. The other thing it mentions right here is that the skin is elastic and pliable. It has to be that way uh, where it's not overdone, but it's not completely tight because when they go to ground and they might get caught on a root and cut or, you know, they're flushing in the foliage, you know, they have to be able to take a, a good cut or two, you know, and keep on working. So that skin is going to help them not get a bunch of wounds. It's also going to help them not get caught on anything. The size, proportion, and stubs, substance of the dachshund breed, um, they are bred and shown in two sizes, standard and miniature. Miniatures are not a separate classification, but compete in a class division for 11 pounds and under at 12 months of age and older. So that's where your um, miniature, open miniature class uh, comes in. The weight of the standard size is usually between 16 and 32 pounds. The dachshund is bred with three varieties of coat, smooth, wire-haired, and long-haired, and is shown in two sizes in those coats, standard and miniature. All three varieties in both sizes must conform to the characteristics already specified. So, I did not put any of this in any kind of breed priority order, um, because I feel like it's, all important and there are certain emphases on things here and we're going to talk about the hallmark of our breed later on in the slideshow so I'm just going to go through exactly how the standard is printed with you tonight okay the head viewed from above or from the side the head tapers uniformly to the tip of the nose and just a note for you a good way to think of this is a wedge head, that's how Arvind de Brogna would describe it, or a conical head. Um, and Jason Walker, who's a judge over in Australia, uses that analogy, a conical head. And I put pictures there for you. I think that makes a lot of sense on how you want it to taper down uniformly. And so that kind of helps gives you a visual. The skull is slightly arched, neither too broad nor too narrow and slopes gradually with little perceptible stop into the finely formed, slightly arched muzzle, giving a Roman appearance. Lips are tightly stretched, well covering the lower jaw. Nostrils are well open, jaws opening wide and hinged well back of the eyes with strongly developed bones and teeth. So I put some examples of some dachshund heads here for you. And we're, I've got some more on later slides. So the dog in the top right hand corner is Sheen of Westphalen. And he was an amazing dog, you know, back in the 50s and 60s. And this is the kind of headpiece that you would typically see. I feel like it's somewhat rare or more rare these days to get these heads with a fill under the eye and the under jaw. I think um, dachshund breeders have tried to look, get a more elegant look. So they've changed the structure of the head just a little bit. And as long as it, you know, conforms to the standard, then um, it's understandable. So that is something that we're striving to do. The other thing is the arch of the muzzle is important because it enhances the dog's olfactory nerves needed for scenting ability. So it's really important that they have that arch in there because they are scent hounds. They're gonna pull all that scent in to do their job. The nostrils need to be well open to help the dog take in oxygen because when he's underground, it's not an oxygen enriched environment down there. You know, there's limited air supply. So it's gonna be very important that he's got a good open nostril, okay? The other thing I wanna mention right here is, um, a few years ago, many years ago, AKC told all the breed clubs to take out any description of another animal that used to describe the dog. So you'll hear old time breeders say and read in some books that were published many, many years ago that the appearance that you want on this head and muzzle looks like a ram's head or a ram's nose. And if you look that up, you can see a description of what that looks like. 
So that might help you. Let's talk about some of the undesirables. And all of these pictures right here are from that visualization of the official docs and standard on page five and six. So if you look at the top row, the very left picture, you can see that this dog has way too much stop, where it's supposed to slightly slope up from the nose between the eyes in what we can call um, maybe an eyebrow, those bones right there, you can see where it stops very hard and makes an L versus a gradual slope. The second picture is ear set too high. These are just too high towards the head. The third picture, the ear set is too low. And you can see compared to a good head that they are very, very low. But we're gonna talk about that here in just a minute. A dome skull is that top right picture and you can see how round and large that is. And what usually happens with a dome skull, if they have a shorter muzzle, um, a lot of times if you're not careful with that, it can you know, hamper the shape of the eye. So that's why it's not very desirable. On the bottom row, the very left picture, this is a picture of lack of under jaw. And I have a lot of people ask me about this. And I think it's a somewhat difficult concept in the beginning to understand. And this dog right here underneath the muzzle has what we would consider a lack of underjaw. You know, the dachshund has a very strong, powerful mouth and it has a very long muzzle full of teeth. And that is to make sure it can grab onto its prey, you know, and which is a hound type of um, trait. So Someone described it to me as being like a chin, which makes a lot of sense. So when you put your hand underneath a dachshund's mouth and their muzzle, you can feel if there's a good solid bone kind of squared off under there or if it's lacking or if it's thin. The next picture is too much dewlap, which is underneath that neck and the chin area, and too much stop. So, that's something that you're going to want to really be careful of. The dewlap underneath on the neck, you don't want that. You want that to be nice and clean because if they're down there, you know, fighting an animal and it grabs them up by the dewlap, you know, they have a hard time getting away. And the ear length is somewhat important. It protects the neck. Um, so when an animal grabs on, it's grabbing the ear versus the neck. The next set of pictures to the right, is a head that's too snipey. It just tapers too quickly. There's not a lot of fill on either side of the jaw. And then the next picture next to that is what a wide back skull looks like. And you know, if you're if you're not experienced, sometimes the dome skull and the wide back skull can have some similar traits. But there again, on a wide back skull, it usually means that your muzzle length um, is short, or you have more of a snappy head, or you know, you may have some eye issues there. So I do want to say on um, a head right here, another question that has come up is a hunter's crest. And dachshunds do have a hunter's crest where the hair seems to run backwards um, along the ridge of the nose between the nostril up to um, the occiput. And so that's okay. It's not any kind of fault or anything. In fact, some breeders will tell you you know, uh, they've been kissed and have the magic touch if they have that hunter's crest. So it's not an undesirable trait to have. Some people just don't like it. And um, the other thing about low ear set before I go into the next slide is sometimes dachshunds are, if they're not sure their environment, you know, they're very animated type of dogs. And so if they're uncertain about something, they may lower that ear or not have it animated. It doesn't necessarily mean it's a low ear set and uh, we're going to kind of talk about that on one of the next slides. Here are some examples of some real head undesirables. The dog on the top left has a very high ear set and a very short muzzle. The dog underneath that on the bottom left has way too much stop and you can see how it stops right there going up towards the eye. The dog on the top right has a high ear set a round eye, a very short muzzle, and a dome head, which is hard to see because of this high ear set. And then the picture on the bottom right is this dog lacks under jaw and has a very snappy head. 
Let's talk about the eyes. Viewed from above or from the side, the head tapers uniformly to the tip of the nose. The eyes are of medium size, almond shape and dark rimmed with an energetic, pleasant expression, not piercing, very dark in color. The bridge bones over the eyes are strongly prominent. Wall eyes, except in the case of dappled dog, are a serious fault. And a wall eye is kind of like a blue eye. So you can look right there and see the correct almond eye shape. So uh, almond shape is kind of described as an oval with tapered corn corners, almost like a little point. Um, a round eye leads them more prone to injury. And an almond shaped eye when they're digging or going to ground is gonna help keep the debris and the dirt out more so than a round eye will. Uh, you don't want a small eye though. D almond doesn't mean small. Um, but when you're trying to get away from the round eye, you don't want it to be a beady looking eye either. So that's something that you want to keep in mind. The head and the ears. The ears are set near the top of the head, not too far forward, of moderate length, rounded, not narrow, pointed, or folded. Their carriage, when animated, is with the forward edge just touching the cheek so that the ears frame the face. So famed dachshund breeder and judge Ann Gordon put in her book that um, this ear set is like an Egyptian headdress. And Gracie Greenberg, who was one of the greats of our breed in the early 1900s, uh, 20s and 30s, also said the same thing. And so I put a picture of that for you to see as an example. Here are some ear undesirables. Okay. A high ear set is not what you want. So there's a picture of that kind of on the right of a high ear set. And you can see how that's just too high up the top of the head to where the top of the ear actually is taller than the skull. To the right of that is a low ear set and you can see how down it is. Uh, I think that the ideal ear length is the length of the muzzle. And that's a good way to measure if you take that ear and wrap it around the muzzle to kind of look. So down at the bottom, you can see a picture of a short ear <clears throat> and you can see, um, look at it compared to the, you know, where it is lying on the neck. And if you were to pull that forward over the muzzle, how short it would be. And then on the bottom right, a pointed short ear where it's not exactly round. And so it says in our standard that you want it to be moderate length, but it's not specific on that. So not too long, not too short. So I like to measure using the length of the muzzle. Here's an example of ears when you wanna really check the animation on a dachshund. So if you look at the picture on the left, this is a dog who does not have animated ears. So it appears that they have a really low ear set. The dog is relaxed. He's just kind of hanging out. The very same dog is in the middle picture. He um, has been alerted. You know, they've got food or something waving in his face to get him alert for the picture. And now his ears are animated. So it's the same dog. You can see the difference. So there is a difference between a low ear set and what's something that looks low. Um, the picture of the puppy on the right, they appear to be low, but they're not animated. And they're also nice and big and full. And so when that happens, you know, they do get heavy, especially long hairs, because they have all that ha hair on their ears. And it can, uh, the weight can make it look low when it's really not. <clears throat> all right, let's talk about the bite. The teeth are a powerful canine teeth. Teeth fit closely together in a scissors bite. An even bite, a level bite, is a minor fault. Any other deviation is a serious fault. And it's serious because they need those teeth to grip their prey. Now, an even bite is listed as a minor fault because it's still very adequate for them to perform their job. So a scissor bite or an even bite still allows them to perform their task. It's when they have an overshot or undershot bite that they cannot um, grab on to what they're working to get <clears throat> or bring things to you. They don't have a lot of control. They can't hold that for a long time. Uh, they should have a mouthful of teeth it's a defense mechanism for them and they have to have that strong jaw for grabbing game. 
if you're new to looking at bites and dachshunds, you want to look at the side of the bite like the pictures show first, and then you want to look at the front of the teeth because you can see an overshot bite. So it can be a little confusing. So kind of turn and look at the front after you look at the side. And the other thing I want to say here is a puppy bite when they're young can be off. So in dachshunds, a lot of time what happens is the lower jaw grows faster than the upper jaw. So it can look correct when they're young and go off and then come back when they're older. Uh, sometimes it will look off and it may even out or fix itself when they're older. So you have to kind of know your line if that happens. You know, don't always throw the baby out with the bathwater. So, you know, keep checking your bites. The neck is long, muscular, clean cut without dewlap, slightly arched in the nape flowing gracefully into the shoulders without creating the impression of a right angle. Okay, so on a dachshund, the head is to be carried out in front of the dog and it should not be straight up from the shoulder because what happens is if you have it look straight up, it gives the illusion of a stovepipe neck and that means the shoulders are not in the correct place. So you want everything to be very clean and nice. Now, my mentor always told me when I was coming up that it should almost look swan-like. And it's not talking about the extreme curvature like the letter S, but she's talking about how nice and clean and smooth everything is going from the head down into the neck, down into the shoulder. Let's talk about the trunk and the abdomen. The trunk is long and fully muscled. When viewed in profile, the back lies in the straightest possible line between the withers and the short, very slightly arched loin. A body that hangs loosely between the shoulders is a serious fault. The abdomen is slightly um, drawn up. Now, I will say on the abdomen slightly drawn up, sometimes you get what we call tuck up right there. And sometimes it's just too much. So it's been my experience if they have a lot of tuck up, they're taller off the ground or their pelvis is too tilted. Um, the other thing that you can see right here is an extra piece of skin, which we call a skirt, which I really like a skirt, but some people just don't like it. So where that abdomen can be slightly drawn up, sometimes you'll have that little skirting there and it won't be, it won't give the illusion of being drawn up with that. So you want to keep that in mind. Let's look at some of the undesirables, and these drawings are taken right out of the visualization of the official Dachshund Standard on page seven. The first picture that you have is a soft top line. And usually what happens when you have a soft top line is you get a dip behind the shoulder, or they can be too long in the loin, or they've got a really um, serious case of short ribbing and keel. On these dogs with soft top lines though, especially when they're stacked, Make sure you watch them on the move because sometimes some dogs are really lazy and on the move, they've got a beautiful straight top line and they look great, but you get them stacked on the table and they want to sink in that top line or sink behind the shoulder uh, or they sink in the rear. So, you know, always watch a dog on the move when you're evaluating them and see if that changes. Now, if it doesn't change, you know, they're definitely soft in the top line and, uh, that can, like I said, be from them being too long in the loin or short ribbing and keel. There's something going on there. Uh, the second picture is a roached um, top line where the last rib ends, the roach will begin usually. So you can see that this dog has some short ribbing. It looks like it's got some short keel or the keel cuts up too quickly. It also looks like they don't have length of rib vertically. So that is, I always worry about roach back dogs knowing that I've had one myself and you worry about back problems because the spine is literally curved and so that is always something you want to be very very careful about. It's very hard on their back when they have a roach back. Um, high in the rear top line. This is where they have usually a short stifle or some angles that are not always matching in the rear. The angles are supposed to give an impression of 90 degrees and when they're high in the rear, they usually don't. 
And a lot of times if they're short in that stifle or don't have the bend to stifle, their hawk is long. And so that what causes them to go more up in the air than the rear. Okay. Now at the beginning, I said that I wasn't gonna put the slideshow in order of priorities, but this right here is huge. The dachshund front is the hallmark of the breed, period. It is the most important piece that has to be correct on our dogs. It's not the only important piece, but it is something hard to attain. And once you have it, it's hard to keep on hold of. So this right here is, you know, when you think of dachshund, this is what you need to think of. For effective underground work, the front must be strong, deep, long, and cleanly muscled. Most breeds do not have a front like this. There's only a few that have similar front descriptions in their standard. And that is the Pembroke Welsh Corgi, the Cardigan Welsh Corgi, and the Dandy Denmont Terrier. They have very specific things in those standards, just like the Dachshund, talking about the layback of shoulder, the long upper arm, the long shoulder blade, and the 90, we have the 90 degree angle, okay? When they don't have the proper front, they exude all of their energy and they get rid of it. So they don't have the endurance to work. The dachshund chest or front, looking at it from the front, the breastbone is strongly prominent and in front so that on either side, a depression or dimple appears. So if you look at the picture on the left, you can see the red arrow pointing to the dimple. When viewed from the front, the thorax appears oval and extends downward to the midpoint of the forearm. So if you look at the picture on the right, you can see in red that oval on the thorax. The enclosing structure of the well-sprung ribs appears full and oval to allow by its ample capacity, complete development of the heart and lungs. This is very, very important for them to do underground work. They have to have that heart and lungs to get down there and work. Because like I mentioned before, it's not an oxygen rich environment. So they have to have, uh, you know, very strong heart and lungs and that has to be inside their wellspring ribs. That's what's gonna keep all of that protected. Here are some examples um, from the visualization of the Dachshund standard on page eight. You can see on the top left, the correct oval front. And also when you look at a Dachshund, that front should be protruding. And we're gonna talk about that on the bottom pictures. So you've got the correct oval front. On the next picture, you've got what is loaded shoulders. So you can see how that's changed, what the front looks like and those shoulders being so heavy weighing down. On the last picture of the top row, you can see an example of a wide and round front. It looks like a barrel because it's circular and not oval. So they spend a lot of time wasting energy because they've got to get around all that extra bulk. If you look down at the bottom picture, you can see on the left the correct front angulation, and we're going to get into that in just a minute. The second picture shows the front moderately set forward. So this is when the shoulder blade and the upper arm are moved forward on the ribs. They're too far towards the front. So we call this too far forward, okay? Um, and usually what happens in a front like this is there's, um, it can be an equal length of shoulder blade to upper arm, but a lot of times, and I'll show you some examples later that it's the upper arm is short. And then if you look at the picture on the bottom right, that is definitely set forward. There is no forechest there at all. And what they're gonna have is a short step. More than likely on a front like this, they're going to have that stove top neck where it's 90 degree angles from the neck into the top line because they just, you know, they can't, it's not back far enough. So the other thing is if you look at the picture on the left of the correct front angulation and look at that protruding, for chest versus the last picture, the definitely step forward, you can see the huge difference on that. Okay, and they have to have that front in order to navigate underground. 
can, you know, have all that uh, ribbing to protect those heart and those big, huge lungs they have. And the other thing is, um, on the move, you can watch the difference in these two fronts. The definitely set forward front, when the front leg is extended out on the move, the front will completely disappear behind the front leg. Whereas on a correct front angulation, when they extend their front foot, then you can still see there are four chests sticking out and it doesn't disappear behind the leg. Um, this upper arm shoulder assembly, when they're, it's moving, when they're down digging and moving the dirt around, it moves like a bicycle pedal. So it just keeps going over and over and over like you would pedal a bike. So it's very important that those angles match so that that piece works because they're digging and moving around down there. Now, they can have a long upper arm and shoulder blade. Like I said, this is the hallmark of our breed, but this right here is really the foundation. Like if you were gonna build a house, this is the foundation on which the dachshund is built. So the keel merges gradually into the line of the abdomen and extends well beyond the front legs. So if you look down at the picture, you can see highlighted in pink, what we are calling the keel and it anchors everything down. It anchors all those ribs down. You know, it holds in place that top line. It makes sure that your upper arm and shoulder blade are secure, okay? It is the foundation of the dachshund, the house which your dog is built. The rib cage viewed from the side is oval and long. So you can see that where that black oval is. This helps the dachshund to back up when they're inside the hole as to not get caught on a rock, a rock or a root or any other obstacle they may encounter underground. Okay, so once again, the keel merges gradually into the line of the abdomen and extends well beyond the front legs. Okay, they have to have a well-defined rib cage and spring of rib to protect the organs, like I've mentioned, so they can work and breathe underground. The other thing that is important about the keel is it's very important that it's very far back as far as it can be, because when they go underground or even above ground and start digging, they sit down on that keel. So they put their whole front down, their rear end is sticking up, and they start digging and they sit on that keel so that their upper arm and shoulder blade can move like a bicycle pedal. So they're like a well-oiled machine. It's important that they have long uh, length of ribs. If it's a short keeled dog, they've got short ribs that cut up and aren't rounded. So if you look at the picture on the bottom um, of the cut off keel, you can see how it just stops abruptly right behind the front legs. And if you look at the skeleton picture, you can see Look at that keel uh, that's highlighted in the dark color compared to the skeleton picture above, and you can see how short that is, okay? Uh, two thirds of the dachshund's weight is in the front and a third of the weight is back behind the ribs. So it, it takes a lot of beating, you know, on this front end and it's really heavy. So it's really important that it's built well. And if you're not exactly sure what keel means, they talk about keels on boats all the time. And I put a picture of the boats with some examples of keels on there for you. And you can see underneath that keel is balanced by a fin. And that's what keeps the boat balanced. So that's why keel is so important on a dachshund because two thirds of the weight is in the front that that keel helps keeps them balanced. Here is a comparison of correct ribbing and keel versus short ribbing and keel. So if you look at the top picture under correct ribbing and keel, you can see highlighted in pink what that uh, keel is supposed to look like under there. If you look at the picture on the right, you can see how short that is compared to the one on the left. Underneath, looking at the ribbing that's supposed to be oval shape and long, you can see the picture on the left, how it fills up that oval, but the picture on the right, it doesn't fill up that oval at all. Look at how short those ribs are vertically. So it doesn't have the strength that it needs supporting the vertebrae. And to me, I consider this like a, a xylophone. A xylophone cuts up very, very short like that. It's not gradual and smooth. So that is, um, a, it's not listed as a fault, but it is a structural problem 
in dachshunds. So it is so and very important that you have your anchor, your keel, the foundation of your house uh, to be as long as you can. Okay, viewed in profile, the lowest point of the breast line is covered by the front leg. So you can see that. Now, a lot of times if the front assembly angles are off, if that shoulder blade to upper arm is open, or the upper arm is short, it will make your dog a little taller off the ground. And if your front is too far forward, then the lowest point of the breast spine isn't covered by the front leg. So it's really, really important that you get that good, correct front with the lay, lay back. Let's talk about our shoulder blades. Our shoulder blades are long, broad, well laid back, and firmly placed upon the fully developed thorax, closely fitted at the withers, furnished with hard yet pliable muscles. In my opinion, there is no such thing as too much layback. I don't ever think we have enough. The more layback, the better. And always keep working for your uh, layback. The other thing is, if you don't have good proper layback, you can get off that neck into the shoulder a roll. Um, there's lots of different kinds of rolls. You know, puppies get them because they're growing. Some dogs have them because they're just way too heavy. They're very overweight. But a lot of times what happens if you get a roll like that, um, no matter how small, is because you don't have enough shoulder layback. So that's something to keep working on. Don't ever be satisfied with the layback that you have. Now, it mentions that this front is held together by long pliable muscles. So highlighted in red, you can see these muscles, how they're entwined and they're braided and layered in there, um, holding that shoulder blade and upper arm, that whole uh, assembly to the dog. It's not attached by bone, it's all muscle. So this is why you'd never wanna walk up to a dachshund and the kind of front it has and pick it up like a child, like a baby under the arms and then have all that weight hanging down off of it. It's really, it hurts them and it's really hard on their muscles. Let's talk about upper arm. The upper arm is ideally the same length as the shoulder blade and at right angles to the latter, strong of bone and hard of muscle lying close to the ribs with elbows close to the body yet capable of free movement. So that's why it's important that you have the correct muscling because it's not attached. It has to be close to the ribs, but it has to have enough give way to move. So it's attached with, you know, muscles and tendons and all of that stuff. So you can see what that upper arm looks like and where it's placed in the body. Now let's talk about if it's short. Okay. This is kind of the Bermuda Triangle, the mystery of the dachshund, trying to get this upper arm the same length as the shoulder blade. So there's all kinds of stuff going on. Because we have um, a breed that's considered a dwarf, you know, they're achondroplastic, they, uh, this allows for them to have a 90 degree angle between that upper arm and shoulder blade. And what happens a lot of time is if it's not the same length, it opens up that angle to 100 degrees, 110 degrees. And so when that happens, more than likely it's opening, pushing that shoulder up into the neck. And you can see that on the diagram here from the correct front and the long upper arm and the shoulder blade on the left to the incorrect short upper arm on the right. And you can see how just the short upper arm changes the angle of the shoulder blade and your layback. Okay. Um, also right here is, like I was saying before, if that shoulder starts to move forward, you can get that roll over the shoulder, which is not desired because it's not clean in the nape. Um, I feel like since this is so hard for us that a lot of times you'll see dachshunds and they'll have it won't be perfectly the same length, but it'll be maybe like two thirds the length. I think that that is adequate. I mean, you always want it to be the same length, but if you've got one that's two thirds the length and it's just a tiny bit short, you know, I think that you can breed with that and deal with that. But if it's anything shorter than that, it's just, it's gonna be really, really hard to work around. 
And also right here, the front foot to the end of the shoulder blade should be a straight line down. So you can see when that opens up that that shoulder blade does not necessarily make a straight line down through that wrist into the foot. So that's going to really hamper your movement. And we'll talk about that later in this presentation. Here are some examples of some four quarters that have a short upper arm or they're too far forward in the front. Okay, so you can see the first dog on the top left. You can see looking at that shoulder blade that that upper arm is not the same length. So now look at the forechest. That whole assembly is moved forward because the upper arm is short. The shoulder blade is now open. It's not 90 degrees anymore, so it's kind of going towards the neck. It's not directly inside that neck, but it's it's inching up there. And they've got a little bit of a force chest sticking out. You can also see how high off the ground that dog is. Let's look at the middle top picture. It's the same thing. You can look and see, look at the long, that to me, looking at that is a long upper arm with a long shoulder blade, but the whole assembly is moved forward. Okay, so look at where that shoulder blade is towards the neck and look how upright that neck looks kind of going into the top line. So that's one of those things that I'm talking about. You know, it gives that illusion of being 90 degrees. So that's why it's very important you have the proper front assembly back as on the dog. The picture on the top right is a dog with a very short upper arm. Once again, look how the end of that um, upper arm inside the rib cage, you can see right there how much that's supposed to be. It's almost halfway up on his body. And you usually want that elbow tucked in. If it's long, it's going to be lower towards the bottom of the rib cage. The bottom left picture is the same. Look how um, short that dog's upper arm is. It looks like it's one third the length of the shoulder blade. And so, you know, he's going to move with a very short step. And uh, look how far forward he is. Look how his front is just almost disappeared. You know, there's hardly any forechest sticking out at all. And so I guarantee you when you flip him around and look at him from the front, he probably doesn't have the correct dimples and indentations he's supposed to have. Uh, the dog on the bottom middle is the same thing. Very short in the upper arm with a long shoulder blade. That front assembly is pushed forward. And the last picture on the bottom on the right, the same thing. Uh, very short upper arm, very far forward. And uh, so that these are not, these are things that you do not want. And unfortunately, we're seeing a lot of this in the ring today. And it's a really hard battle to fight. So, you know, I think that's why they say their breed is a front breed, because that's really what you want to concentrate on the most, because it's the hardest to get. And once you have it, it's the hardest to hold on to. So, you know, really pay attention to your fronts. With these kind of fronts, they cannot perform the job that they were bred to do for long periods of time because they've wasted all that energy. You know, they don't have the endurance. Let's talk about the four quarters, this little forearm right here, very, very important piece of the puzzle. It is short, supplied with hard yet pliable muscles on the front and outside with tightly stretched tendons on the inside and at the back slightly curved inwards. So that's really important right there. It is slightly curved inwards, okay? So if you look at the picture on the right in the little red box, you can see what that bone looks like. The bone itself is straight, but how it sits in the front assembly is slightly curved, okay? So, and it does, the bone in the forearm quarter does have a tiny bit of a curvature to it because of the way that front assembly works. The joints between the forearms and the feet at the wrist are closer together than at the shoulder joints so that the front does not appear absolutely straight. This is a perfect example of this in this picture. So if you look at the wrist at the bottom, you can see that those are way closer together than the shoulder joints and you can look at this front and you can see that it does not appear straight okay so this is something very correct now this is the holy grail in dachshunds it's what you want it's what you want it's what you're searching for okay this is the wraparound front this gets very very confusing for people especially new people okay so here's what the wraparound front is. It is the inclined shoulder blades. 
the upper arms and the curved forearms form a parentheses that enclose the rib cage, creating the correct wraparound front. So if I move those red parentheses, you would be able to see all those bones in there, the shoulder blades, the upper arm, the curved forearm. Okay, so you put the parentheses on there. It's not exactly perfect on the red lines, but you get the drift, okay? If you're not really sure what that still means, uh, Arvind Abrogny likes to call it an egg sitting on a stand. So I have put that picture there for you. And that right there describes perfectly what a wraparound front looks like. A wrap front is not the muscling and all that stuff that keeps everything tucked in. You know, the wrap front, what we call a wraparound front is the parentheses. Okay, we do have a four quarters DQ. Knuckling over is a disqualifying fault. So what happens when you have knuckling over is the wrist bulges out. And it may seem as the weight is bearing on part of the body that can't support the dog's weight. And remember I said two thirds of the dachshund weight is in the front. So that's why this is a fault. So what happens too is there's uneven growth um, on the pasterns between the bone and the tissue and the muscle and um, between the forearm and the foot. So everything kind of just gets heavy and it buckles under. Uh, there's a lot of reasons for this. A lot of it, it could be injury and puppyhood or there's been some trauma. I will say that I've really never seen this in the show ring. Um, there was a, a special weird instance a few years ago where somebody showed a dog one day and it did quite well. And then the next day was DQ'd for knuckling over and we couldn't really figure it out. So um, sometimes dogs get lazy and they'll kind of try to pop in and out on that. You know, like if they, like I said, they're front heavy. So if they kind of put the weight all the way over their front, which is how they're supposed to be stacked, you know, that may pop out. That doesn't mean it's that way all the time but you don't want to train your dog to do that. So check that out. Let's go into the front feet. The front feet, front paws are full, tight, compact with well-arched toes and tough, thick pads. They may be equally inclined a trifle outward. So kind of like a basset hound, their feet are not straight. A dachshund can be a little outward at the wrist. There are five toes, four in use, close together, with a pronounced arch and strong, short nails. The front dew claws may be removed. So if the dew claws are removed, then it's not five toes anymore. It's the four toes that are in use. So keep that in mind, okay? It's, um, they've got to have a correct foot because they're hunting in rough terrain all day long. So a good foot is going to help them. And that correct foot should be thick it's full and tight, it just feels good. Uh, a flat foot is more thin, you can feel it. Um, and it's a little bit longer almost looking in the toe. A splayed foot is where all the toes separate out and it's definitely flat and it's definitely thin. And a lot of a splayed foot issues come from the kind of uh, stuff that they're raised up with when they're puppies. Um, it could be nutrition. It could be poor nail care. Um, it could be over and under supplementing with the vitamins and some of it's just genetics. So you wanna be really careful what surfaces you're raising those puppies on. They need something really good to grip on um, besides just a flat, smooth surface. So, you know, get them on lots of different things, get them on dirt, get them on gravel, um, not always on concrete, you know, even in blankets they can kind of grip on. So, you know, be cognizant of that. Let's go into the hindquarters. The hindquarters are strong and cleanly muscled. The pelvis, the thigh, the second thigh, and the rear pastern are ideally the same length and give the appearance of a series of right angles. So you can see in this example, between the pelvis and the thigh, that gives the appearance of a right angle. Between the thigh and the second thigh, that gives the appearance of a right angle. And between the second thigh and the rear pastern, which docks and fanciers call a hawk, it gives the appearance of a right angle. The hindquarters are also strong and cleanly muscled. The pelvis, the thigh, the second thigh, and the rear pastern, again, are ideally the same length and give the appearance of a series of right angles. 
So one of the things that I want to mention right here is if you look at the pelvis, you can see that it's tilted. It's not flat. It's not parallel to the ground. Okay, so that's going to make a real difference in some of your rear assembly, especially when it's moving. So if there is a straight stifle, more than likely, if you look at the picture on the right, if it's straight in the stifle, it's also more than likely going to be a long hawk. And the second thigh is more than likely a little short. Sometimes it's not. Sometimes it just doesn't have the angle that it's supposed to be. So you can take and see these two. I see a lot of this in the ring. And sometimes people have concentrated so much on their fronts breeding wise that they forgot about the rear or they act like a rear doesn't matter. And that is not true because in order for a dog to move correctly, it has to have a rear that matches the front. And a lot of times if you have a straight stifle or long hawk, dog or short in the stifle dog, more than likely the front angles also match. So you're probably looking at a short upper arm or an open shoulder. So those are things that you, you know, want to look at because a table is balanced if I unfold the legs and it's got a straight front and a straight rear if you talk about the table legs. But we've got dogs with all these angles now. So you have to put that in there. So if the angles aren't correct, it won't hold up the top of the table, which is the top line. The hindquarters. From the rear, the thighs are strong and powerful. The legs turn neither in nor out. And you can see this in this example. And we're going to talk here in a few slides about what it looks like when they do turn in or out. The rear pasterns, what we call hawks, are short and strong, perpendicular to the second thigh bone. When viewed from behind, they are upright and parallel. This is the editor's note from our DCA visualization. Docs and fanciers use the term hock to describe the entire lower section of the leg from the hock joint through the foot. So don't think you're crazy if you use hock versus rear pastern. The hind paws are smaller than the front paws with four compactly closed and arched toes with tough thick pads. The entire foot points straight ahead and is balanced equally on the ball and not merely on the toes. Rear dew claws should be removed. Now, a few things about this. Notice that it says the entire foot in the rear points straight ahead. Remember, the front foot can be point incline out just a little bit, but the back feet point straight ahead. Okay. The other thing is how it says balanced equally on the ball and not merely on the toes. I think a lot of this is exhibitor error because you try to outstretch your dog. They don't have the bend to stifle or the length to stifle or they've got a long hawk. So to make them look stretched out so their rear doesn't look more underneath themselves is you take that hawk and crank it all the way back so they're balancing on their tiptoes versus this ball of their foot, which is the center point for balance. So what happens is your dogs get on there and their hawks start going like this and they can't stand and then you get mad at them. So practice with your dog, making sure that that's on the ball of the foot because they can't stand steady otherwise. The croup is long, rounded and full, sinking slightly towards the tail. And remember in um, the beginning, when we're talking about top line, it said that there can be a slight rise. So you can see in this picture where it, that top line is rising into the croup. Now let's talk about tail sets. Tail sets are really very important, okay? They are set in continuation of the spine, extending without kinks, twist, or pronounced curvature, and not carried too gaily. So the tail set is really important because if a dog gets in trouble underground, they've gotta go get pulled out by the tail. If you see the rear end of a dog underneath the fence, you're gonna go grab them up by the tail and pull them out. So it has to be very strong because you're yanking that whole dog because it's a continuation of the spine. So you've got to pull them out. You want it to be very strong and you want it to be very, very correct so that it doesn't injure them. A pump tail, you can feel on a pump tail. If you look at the example down there of a cow or a pump tail, how it looks like a pump handle, you can feel when you're running your hand off the top of, over the top line down towards the tail, a little dimple or indentation 
right there after the croup. And so more than likely you'll have a gay tail or a cow or a pump tail. I, and I know about this because I fight this in my line um, and it's, it's very hard to get rid of. So um, the other thing is there is a difference in a dachshund between a gay tail and a happy tail. And I've seen dachshunds that get really, really super excited and that tail goes straight up in the air. It's not like that normally. So that's why it's really important that you're feeling how that tail comes off the end of the body. Now you definitely don't want a gay tail um, on a dachshund, but more so on a long hair dachshund because they have a tail flag. And we're gonna talk about what that's supposed to look like here in just a minute. All right, dachshund movement. For me, I think if you're talking about breed priorities, after the front is the dachshund movement. And so when they say a rear isn't important, it, it cannot be true if you're gonna have the right movement because the dog cannot move on a front alone. So a dachshund movement on the gate is fluid and smooth. The four legs reach well forward without much lift in unison with the driving action of the hind legs. The correct shoulder assembly and well-fitted elbows allow the long free stride in front. Viewed from the front, the legs do not move in exact parallel planes, but incline slightly forward. And that's due to the slightly curved forearm. So if you look at the picture on the right of the dog coming towards you, you can see that correct wrap front with that shoulder blade and your um, forearm and uh, upper arm. And you can see how, look underneath where that dog's feet are moving, okay? The other thing is movement is where you can see balance and soundness and the dachshund must be able to hold their ideal outline while in a trot. So this is, I cannot stress this enough. Dachshunds are not a running breed. They're not supposed to be. They should gait freely. Now some dogs, you have to let them go at their own speed and some of them move a lot faster than others, but they should never be trained to move faster to hide a faulty rear or something. So, you know, it, it's just not a running breed at all. Uh, the front should not disappear when they're on the move. So if you look down at these pictures, you can see on these profile pictures, the front has not disappeared with the front leg extended. Okay, let's talk about the rear on the move. The hind legs drive on a line with the forelegs with hop joints and rear pasterns, the metatarsis, turning neither in nor out. The propulsion of the hind leg depends on the dog's ability to carry the hind leg to complete extension. So if you look down at the picture of the black and tan dog, you can see with the arrows, okay, the hind leg depends on the dog's ability to carry the hind leg to complete extension. Viewed in profile, the forward reach of the hind leg equals the rear extension, and that's what the arrows show. So you can see that with the dog's back leg moving forward, as far forward as it goes from the center of balance, the rear leg also moves back. So that's what that sentence means. So the forward reach of the hind leg equals the rear extension. Okay. Now, I have put the same sentence up there because that's really important. So the thrust of correct movement is seen when the rear pads are clearly exposed during rear extension. So if you look at diagram one, you can see the rear pad and how clearly exposed it is. Rear feet do not reach upward towards the abdomen and there is no appearance of walking on the rear pasterns. So that's something that we call a belly tapper. And what happens is a lot of times is their pelvis is not at the correct angle. And so their whole rear assembly is moved underneath the dog and they can't extend out in the rear. So all they can do is move up and it moves up towards the abdomen, towards the belly. Okay. If you look at diagram one and two, you can see the correct movement and stance is viewed from the rear. And once again, feet must travel parallel to the line of motion with no tendency to swing out, cross over, or interfere with each other. If you look at diagram three, okay, that is incorrect rear because the hawks turn outward, what we would call cow hawks. And diagram four is an incorrect rear because the hawks turn outward and the toes turn in. So this is my advice to you, okay? 
now when our dachshunds who are built on 90 degree angles give a series of angles in this rear some of them have so many angles that they cannot stand on those for long periods of time and it doesn't always mean that there's an incorrect build in there it's just the nature of the beast so sometimes they can't stand long on the ground or on a table which is why it's very very important that you judge the dog on the move and not just by a stack so if you're doing a table exam and they seem a little wobbly in the rear watch them move and that will tell you a lot of things that you need to know um, sometimes in that rear the growth plate can close on a leg early and we're going to talk about that um, here in, in just a minute okay feet must travel parallel to the line of motion with no tendency to swing out cross over or interfere with each other it's kind of like a train track when they're going down the trains going down the train train track the wheels on that uh, train are not interfering with each other they are parallel to the line of motion okay a tricycle is the same thing except instead of having it being on the same plane parallel to the line of motion now you have one wheel that's more in the center and two wheels that are balanced on the outside and that's kind of how a dachshund is built because they're going to move you know closer at the wrist underneath that front than necessarily in the rear even though the feet travel on the parallel um, parallel to the line of motion short choppy movement rolling or high stepping gait close or overly wide coming or going are incorrect the dachshund must have agility freedom of movement and endurance to do the work for which he was developed okay so let's look at these diagrams these dogs on the move uh, the picture on the left is from the visualization of the standard um, on page 15 this is the correct sequential gait. And I'm really, really glad they put this diagram in here because a lot of times when we're trying to get action shots on our dachshunds, you know, we'll get a lot of what they have to do in the middle of that movement and go, well, they're not extending, they're not moving. Well, they're not supposed to. This is exactly what they're supposed to look like. So it's really important that you get that camera clicked right at the moment you're supposed to. The movement should be efficient to avoid fatigue. Um, now, one of the problems that we have right here is some of the dogs, if they don't match the angles in the front and the rear, they do what we, you know, we consider bouncing. And what happens is it's caused by more momentum in the rear than it is in the front because the angles don't match. So the rear is going a little faster pace in the front and it doesn't have, the dog doesn't have a way to, you know, get rid of that energy. So the energy moves up instead of out in front and so it causes a bouncing sensation um, and they also will probably like some reach in the front as well but they've got a lot of drive in the rear so sorry uh the, like i said the movement must be efficient to avoid fatigue so you don't want bouncing and you can see it when they're doing that and you can watch <clears throat> okay uh, I told you in the beginning that dachshunds are built on a series of angles. Um, only one specific angle that we have in our standard at 90 degrees between the shoulder blade and upper arm. But right here, you can see that if it's correct, that they will have maximum reach with their movement on their front foot at a 45 degree angle, and it will extend in the same line of travel as the shoulder blade. So this is why this is really important that this is laid back, that you have a 90 degree um, angle between the shoulder blade and upper arm, and that uh, you know, you've got good ribbing and keel because you want them to get that maximum reach. Now, I'm gonna screen share with you. Let's go talk about movement. Let's see if I can get this pulled up for you. Should be over here. So let's look at this get this out of the way for you make sure I can see it and um, this is a diagram that was done by Melissa Swarab which is absolutely brilliant so what she's done is you know done some different diagrams for us so if you look up at the top and with the little dachshunds moving you can see the correct movement on a dachshund you can see that that shoulder blade is working in conjunction with that upper arm like i said like a bicycle pedal and you can look at those rear angles that are built on 
a series of what I would consider almost 90 degree angles and how that moves. Look at the second diagram where it says it's over angulated in the rear and there's no drive. Okay. Look at how the dachshund moves underneath itself. This is what we call a belly tapper and it can't reach and drive. See how, watch the back um, pad of the foot, how it can barely extend off of the ground and all the motion is done underneath the abdomen of the dog. If you look at the very last picture with the short forearm and the high step, okay, this is what happens when you get that short upper arm in there and if the assembly is too far forward. Look how high it has to reach because it has so much energy that in order to follow through, it has to take a higher step because it's making up for the short upper arm. Okay, so this website is, um, in, like I said, I put the web address in the presentation so that you can go to this. And the other neat thing about this is if you take your mouse and move it over different parts, you can see the head and the skull. You can see the shoulders, okay, the step forward, all of these things. She's taken this and made it really amazing. So let's go back here. Okay, so that's what you're kind of looking for on dachshund movement. Let's talk about temperament. Very, very important for dachshunds. The dachshund is clever, lively, and courageous to the point of rashness, persevering in above and below ground work with all senses well developed. Any display of shyness is a fault. Now there's a big difference between shyness and being reserved. And there's a big difference between being shy and being noise sensitive. So sometimes dogs may seem that they have a bad temperament, but they just get overwhelmed and overloaded with all of the noise. Um, I will say, I think it's really important if you're judging to don't stare the dachshund in the eye. Don't walk up to that table and stare it in the eyeball. Uh, dachshunds are very confrontational or, you know, that's when that shyness could show and they don't like that. So you've got to put your hands on it. So, you know, don't stare it in the face. And the other thing is if it has a reaction to you, when you walk up to it, take a step back, walk to the side of the dog and approach the dog from the side. Um, if it doesn't work straight on and I, you know, when I've judged and I've been able to put my hands on dogs that way, where if I came up too fast on them in the front, they didn't like that. I think some other um, synonyms for dachshunds and other descriptive words are very, very important because they have a very uh, complex temperament and personality. So I think that they're smart and they're fearless. They're friendly, silly, goofy, jovial. They're clown-like. But some dogs, especially smooth, are more serious. Uh, dachshunds are brave. They're courageous. They're thinkers. Some of them are reserved. And then on the, you know, far um, spectrum of their personality, dachshunds are very stubborn. They're brash. They're obnoxious. They're ornery. You know, they march to their own drummer, not even to their own beat. They have to have their very own drummer. So, you know, it's a multifaceted type of temperament. And it's funny, <laughs> you'll hear your vet say, I've only ever been bitten once and it was by a dachshund or, you know, the mailman as I've only ever been, you know, ankle bit by a dachshund that chased me down the street. So temperament for our dogs is very, very important. Let's talk about the different coats now. Let's talk about smooths. The coat on a smooth is short, smooth, and shining. It should be neither too long nor too thick. Ears are not leathery. The tail is gradually tapered to a point, well, but not too richly haired. Long sleek bristles on the underside are considered a patch of strong growing hair, not a fault. A brush tail is a fault, as is also a partially or wholly hairless tail. Now comes the fun part. We're going to talk about colors. There's a lot of information on colors. So let's talk about one color dachshunds. Okay. On a one color dachshund, the color of hair, the base color is immaterial. Certain patterns and basic colors will predominate. One color dachshunds include red and cream. 
with or without a shading of interspersed dark hairs. A small amount of white on the chest is acceptable, but not desirable. Nose and nails are black. Now, the one thing I do want to say before we get into color is there are some, you know, rules and DQs. But if they meet the color in the standard, my attitude is if the house is built solid, then the paint color doesn't matter if it is in line with what the standard says. So I know some people say, well, you know, these judges have a hang up. They don't like colored dachshunds. Well, you know, that's why we want to do education and everything. So uh, keep that in mind. Now on a red or cream, they have to have a black nose and black nails. Sometimes you will get a dilute in your breeding and you'll get a, a brown nose red or a red nose red. We call them, you know, E-reds. And it's a dilute in the color and the standard says for a one color dachshund they have to have black nose and black nails so a dilute e-red is not acceptable to show in the show ring okay um the other thing that is not acceptable is an all black solid dog okay we don't have just black dogs those are two color dogs black and tan and we're going to talk about that on the next slide. Let's talk about two color dachshunds. Two color dachshunds include black, chocolate, wild boar, gray, which is blue, and fawn, which we call Isabella, each with deep, rich tan or cream markings over the eyes, on the sides of the jaw and underlip, on the inner edge of the ear, front, breast, sometimes on the throat, inside and behind the front legs, on the paws and around the anus, and from where to about one third to one half of the length of the tail on the underside. Now, I'm not measuring when I judge the, you know, tan under the tail or whatever, but you know, you you don't want the markings, to me, muddy darkings, uh, muddy markings. I don't like the way that they look, but sometimes that just happens, but it doesn't say anything in the standard. It's just a personal preference. You want them to have on top of the, you know, their little, what I call headlights, you know, on their, above their eye. Uh, so this is what I'm talking about. You just don't want a solid color dachshund. If they're supposed to be a two color dachshund, they have to have tan or cream points. So it can be a black and tan or it can be a black and cream. Those are acceptable. Undue prominence of tan or cream markings is undesirable. A small amount of white on the chest is acceptable but not desirable. Nose and nails. In the case of black dogs, black. For chocolate and all other colors, dark brown but self-colored is acceptable. It is only acceptable on two color dachshunds. So keep that in mind. Let's look at some examples of two color dachshunds. You black and tan, chocolate and tan, wild boar on a wire. You can also have wild boar smooths, gray, which you know is blue, or the fawn, which is Isabella. Now, I have never seen a blue dachshund in the ring. And I know of a breeder that had a beautiful one um, that they had bred, but it's just not common. And the fawn Isabella is the same thing. It's just not common. I think it's really rare that you see those colors. And unfortunately, what's happening a lot right now is um, people who mass produce puppies have called these colors rare, which I guess they are. And so they sell them for big of money and, and breed the snot out of them. So, uh, you know, it's, that's a whole other can of worms. Let's talk about patterns. We've talked about colors. Let's talk about patterns. They're not the same thing, okay? Dapple dachshunds. The dapple merle pattern is expressed as lighter colored areas contrasting with the darker base color, which may be any acceptable color. Neither the light nor the dark color should predominate. Nose and nails are the same as for one and two colored dachshunds. Partially or wholly blue wall eyes are as acceptable as dark eyes. A large area of white on the chest of a dapple is permissible. Now, a wall eye is only accepted in a dapple. 
So, you know, you've got to really know your standard while you're reading this. It, it's only for a dapple. A brindle is a pattern as opposed to a color in which black or dark stripes occur over the entire body, although in some specimens, the pattern may be visible only in the tan points. The piebald. Now there's a lot here. So this is very important. So there's pictures of piebalds um, down at the bottom of this slide. The piebald is a pattern opposed to a color with clearly defined areas and or patches of white on any allowed one colored or two colored dogs. Two colored piebald pattern dogs may show tan markings on the face and around the anus. There are no patches of lighter shadings within the colored areas as in the dapple pattern. Ticking in the white areas is acceptable. Eye color, eye rims, nose and lips are well pigmented and in accordance with the base color. Eyes are never partially or wholly blue as distinguished from the dapple pattern. Eyes partially or wholly blue is a disqualification on a dapple, okay? Head, I mean, I'm sorry, on a piebald, please excuse me, on a piebald. Head must not be more than 50% white and colors other than white must cover both ears, back and front, and extend without interruption from the ears over both eyes. A head of more than 50% white or white on any portion of either ear, back or front, or around the eyes is a disqualification. Pure white dogs with no body spots except on the head are to be disqualified. Nails may be partially or wholly white. Now, that's a lot. Um, so, you know, if you're not familiar, this is something uh, before judging dachshunds or, you know, putting one of these in the ring, you probably, you want to read this section of the standard. It's pretty specific on what they're looking for for piebald. Let's go to sable. The sable pattern consists of a uniform dark overlay on red dogs. The overlay hairs are double pigmented with the tip of each hair much darker than the base color. The pattern usually displays as a widow's peak on the head. Nose, nails, and eye rims are black. Eyes are dark, the darker the better. Now on a sable, if you take your hand and you rub it backwards over the coat, you can see underneath the dark, okay, at the hair that's closest to the skin is red. It's lighter, it's red. And as it gets out, the tip of the hair is much darker. So that's how you know you have a true sable. Okay, colors and patterns other than those specified are disqualification. So here's some really good examples of dogs that they um, have, you know, lots of white on their head, um, on their body, their markings are not dispersed. Um, and the other thing I have to say is if you've judged dachshunds for a really long time, that we no longer in our standard have anything about doubled apples. So that is out and they are not allowed in the ring. So that is something else that you wanna make sure that you're up on. Now, if you have any questions about colors, I am not a color expert by any means. So we have some excellent dachshund fanciers that are really in, up on the colors and uh, there's links. Um, Sandy Russell is one who is really up on all the patterns and the lingo and everything and she's written a fantastic article that you can Google online. So I would suggest that you do so. Okay, that was all smooth. Let's go into wire. Okay, with the exception of jaw, eyebrows and ears, the whole body is covered with a uniform, tight, short, thick, rough, hard outer coat, but with finer, somewhat softer, shorter hairs, undercoat, ev everywhere distributed between the coarser hairs. The absence of an undercoat is a fault. The distinctive facial furnishings include a beard and eyebrows. On the ears, the hair is shorter than on the body, almost smooth. The general arrangement of the hair is such that the wire hair dachshund when viewed from a distance resembles the smooth. Any sort of soft hair in the outer coat, wherever found on the body, especially on the top of the head, is a fault. The same is true of long, curly, or wavy hair, or hair that sticks out irregularly in all directions. 
The tail on a wire hair is robust, thickly haired, gradually tapering to a point. A flag tail is a fault. While the most common colors are wild boar, black and tan, and various shades of red, all colors and patterns listed above um, that we talked about for smooths are admissible. The wild boar appears as banding of the individual hairs and imparts an overall grizzled effect, which is most often seen on wire hair dachshunds, but it may also appear on other coats. And you can see those um, in smooths sometimes. Tan points may or may not be evident. Variations include red boar and chocolate and tan boar. Nose, nails, and eye rims are black on wild boar and red boar dachshunds. On chocolate and tan boar dachshunds, nose, nails, eye rims, and eyes are self-colored. The darker, the better. A small amount of white on the chest, although acceptable, is not desirable. Nose and nails the same for the smooth variety. So let's look at some of these. Okay, um, that you have a black and tan wire hair. Uh, the Wheaton is a shade of red, and you'll hear them call it Wheaton, but that's what it is. So it's just a, you know, a shade of red that's acceptable. There's a chocolate and tan. There's an example of a wild boar. There's a red piebald. So the color is red, which is acceptable, and the piebald is the pattern, which is acceptable. And then there's an example of a red wire. Let's go to the long hair. The sleek, glistening, often slightly wavy hair is longer under the neck and on the forechest, the underside of the body, the ears, and behind the legs. The coat gives the dog an elegant appearance. Short hair on the ear is not desirable. Too profuse a coat, which masks type equally long hair over the whole body, a curly coat, or a pronounced parting on the back are false. The color of hair is the same for the smooth. The nose and the nails color is the same for the smooth. Okay. The long hair dachshund tail is carried gracefully in prolongation of the spine. The hair attains its greatest length here and forms a veritable flag. So you can see when that dachshund is on the move, the tail is an extension of the top one, and you can see how the flag it carries um, gracefully down. Let's talk about judging dachshunds. Okay, the foregoing description is that of the ideal dachshund. Any deviation from the above described dog the standard must be penalized to the extent of the deviation, keeping in mind the importance of the contribution of the various features towards the basic original purpose of the breed. So a typical dachshund specimen is balanced, sound, and well-built and should not be drastically penalized for minor things. So this is really important to keep in mind if when you're judging. Let's talk about judging dachshunds. The whole of the dog is greater than the sum of its parts. So this is true for any dog, but definitely for our dog, because like I said, you know, our wraparound front is very important. Our gait is very important. And then our rear it, and then our head. If you go in order of importance of how many lines are written in the standard about those things, it is front, gait, rear head okay and we are not a head breed at all so I, I would never ding a dachshund on a, a head unless it was a it had to it had come down to that and it was a deciding factor so uh, we'll go over some of the some of those things in just a minute dachshunds are the three l's they're long low and level our breed priorities are the front the gate the rear and then the head it is so important and I must advise anyone judging our breed, do not judge on the stack alone, watch the motion. And here's a perfect example over here on these pictures. This is the same bitch, pictured at two different times. And if you look at the picture on the bottom, you can see she gives the appearance of being a little far forward in the front, soft in the top line. But if you look at the picture on top, she's none of those things. So it's very, very important. Like I said, dachshunds are all angles. And even though they're working out in the field all day, it's not a natural stack all the time for them to be in what we do for them in the show ring, unless they're really conditioned with that. And they've been over and over that. That's been my personal experience. People may not agree with that. But it is very important that you watch those dogs move, then judge them on the table, and then watch them move again. 
so that you can feel what you think you see. The dachshund is not a running breed. <clears throat> it's just not. Uh, dachshunds are not always flashy in the ring either. And this is where the wire hairs and the long hairs have a real edge over the smooths because smooths can be pretty all business, very serious in the ring, and they're not going to be pizzazz in their personality. Whereas some long hairs and wires, I think they're so amazing to watch if they just ooze and drip that personality. But smooths are not going to be that way all the time. So don't don't be non-impressed. Or if a dog goes down and back and you click at them and they kind of look at you like, what do you want? Or they don't even want to look at you. It's not because they've got a bad temperament or anything like that. It's just simply that they're a dachshund and they're not impressed at all. So that is something we have to deal with as breeders all the time. Uh, the other thing that's really important is that dachshunds are not fully mature until they're at least at the earliest 18 to 24 months old. And so sometimes when they're in puppy class or whatever, they may have the puppy squats because they're still figuring out how to stand on those angles in the rear. Um, a long hair coat takes years to come in. So don't expect a fully coated long hair in the six to nine, nine to 12, or even 12 to 18 month class. You know, so keep those things in mind too. Um, our dachshund disqualifications, according to the standard, are neckling over the front legs. In the piebald pattern, the eyes are partially or wholly blue, um, or a head of more than 50% white, or white covering any portion of the ears, back and front, uh, or, or around the eyes, or a pure white body with no body spots except for the head, and any color or pattern other than what was spe specified before. Um, to make it easy for you, I pulled out from the standard what was a major fault versus a minor fault versus a fault uh, that wasn't specified as major or minor. So let's look at these. So the major faults in dachshunds are walleyes, except in the case of dappled dogs, bite, overshot, or undershot, or a body that hangs loosely between the shoulders. There are three major faults listed in the standard. There is one minor fault, which is an even bite. Okay. Faults that are not specified whether they're major or minor, it just says fault, are for smooths, a brush tail, partly or wholly hairless tail, wires, any sort of soft hair in the outer coat, wherever found on the body, especially on the top of the head, wires, long, curly, or wavy hair, or hair that sticks out irregularly in all directions, wires, flag tail, longs, too profuse a coat which masks tight, longs, equally long hair over the whole body, a curly coat, or a pronounced parting on the backs. Now, these are things that are specifically listed as a major fault, a minor fault, or just a fault. There are several times where you will see the word undesirable, okay, but they're not faults. They're just not desirable, so, you know, keep that in mind. Let's look at some severe structural issues in dachshunds, and I've never seen a lot of this in the show ring, but uh, for breeders, this is really important. So, let's talk about bandy legs. Bandy legs are bowed legs in the front. A fiddle front is elbows out, pasterns at the wrist are close, and the feet turn outwards. So you can see what that looks like in the picture. And pest virus is something that, you know, dachshunds have to battle. And this is otherwise known as angular hog deformity. And what this is, is a deformity that gives both legs in the rear. And it's usually when the growth plates close early in one side of that bone, um, and that hawk, you know, down back in that angle, it quits growing. So it makes the bone uneven and it gives the bowed legs and it's pretty painful. People will do surgeries on it and stuff. So um, I would suggest if you ever get that, that you remove it from your breeding program, you know, wherever you got it from, remove it from the breeding program. The dachshund is a very versatile breed and we've talked about their structure and their, what they were bred to do and everything. So let's take a look at some of these activities that are very popular in AKC besides just confirmation. Field trials, where they go out and flush the rabbits, um, hugely popular, you know, because dachshunds are so versatile and can do, do so many different things, you, we have a lot of, you know, dual champions and versatility winners and all kinds of stuff. Earth dog. If you've never been to any of these events, field trial will change your life if you go um, on what the form and the function of the breed really looks like in action, and so is earth dog. And I was 
never so impressed my very first earth dog event that I went to and watched the docks and actually fold up like it's supposed to and go down in these, uh, you know, tunnels and everything. And, and they love it. Obedience rally. I'm very super impressed by anybody that can do obedience or rally with a dachshund. Um, and so it's amazing to watch these dogs work that can do it. And, uh, especially if you can do a, a downstay or any of that stuff, because sometimes these dachshunds are just such knuckleheads, but they're very clown-like, so you can't even be mad at them. Scent work. Our dachshunds are scent hounds. They are bred to do this, and they love it, and it's becoming very popular. It can be done in or outdoors. Agility. I know some breeds you just wouldn't think would be able to to do agility, but we have some dachshunds that are very talented at agility, and uh, I think it's amazing. Trick dog, which is something AKC has added that's become very, very popular, and this is right up Dachshunds Alley. They love to do stuff like this. Therapy dog. Uh, they make great therapy dogs. They are very, very popular, as you can see, and uh, you know, they really can be in tune with you of what's going on. And if you look at the picture in the bottom right hand corner, that is Burns, who was uh, Mr. Westminster Group One winner, the Hound Group, um, you know, over a year ago. And he is a dual champion, a field champion, as well as a confirmation champion. And he's also a therapy dog and just loves it. Uh, tracking, uh, you know, which our dogs are really, really great at. Fast cat and coursing. If you look at these dogs, <laughs> you can see they're having the time of their life. You know, they're really built for this. Um, and you can see in that picture, that top right, that smooth, how when they run at full speed, how everything kind of folds up. So, you know, that is definitely form and function. Dock diving. I think is absolutely amazing with our dogs, you know, because they are so front heavy. Uh, some of our dogs are great swimmers, but some of them will sink like a rock. So I think that any dog that loves to do dog diving like dachshunds is amazing. Barn hunt, which is a non AKC event is becoming very, very popular. And this is right up dachshunds alley because, you know, they can sniff and dig out, you know, find that quarry in there and they just love it. Resources for this presentation. Um, the visualization of the official Dachshund standard that you can get from the Dachshund Club of America. It is this book right here. Um, any Dachshund person serious about the breed needs to have it, and I would recommend it for any judge as well. It's great to have in your library. It's a, a phenomenal resource. Uh, Dachshund Club of America website. Um, I also use Cox on Dachshunds by Herman Cox. It's also an amazing resource. The Complete Dachshund by Dee and Bruce Hutchinson. The Dachshund, A Dog for Town and Country by Ann Gordon. A New Owner's Guide to Dachshunds by Kay Ladd. And The Dachshund by Anna Catherine Nicholas. And also a great resource um, is the Dachshund History Project, which I put the web address on there. Uh, it's amazing. And the other thing I would always recommend is the Dachshund 101 site where we com are compiling all of this information. And so uh, it, that makes it really nice. So I'm going to go through and see if I have any questions. I don't see any there. Let's go look over here. So this should hopefully cover everything for you guys. And if you have any questions, you know, you can email me or private message me. Um, you know, I'd love to talk about the dachshund. It's one of my most favorite things to do. So to see if we have any questions. Don't, me. don't think or that you do. Message me. Uh, good to hear me talking. So I'll give it just a second to see if we do have any questions. And if not, turn it over. Okay, doesn't look like we do. Like I said, if you have any questions, you can reply in this thread. I have made this presentation public on my own page. So, you know, share it, cross post it. I'd love to get the information out there. Um, sometimes, you know, dachshunds can be a confusing breed to really understand their standard, and especially for new people or, uh, you know, new judges. I find it very important right now to educate people on dachshunds and really promote our breed. Um, I feel very strongly about, 
you know, having a great specimen be in the group ring and not getting any kind of a cut or placement over a mediocre beagle. And, you know, us as docs and fanciers just have to educate more and do better about that. So, you know, that's my goal with this. So I hope everybody enjoyed. Like I said, if you have any questions or comments, put them in the feed and I hope you have a good evening.